You know, from the very beginning, the firstborn belonged to God. One of the reasons why some of the sacrifices were is because the firstborn had to be redeemed. The Lord says the firstborn are mine, and that's just not talking about animals, talking about people. And that's why death passed over the firstborn in Egypt. We are the firstborn. We find in Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He, he is the first of many sons that God is bringing to, to glory through the work of Jesus Christ, the work of the cross the work of sanctification, the work of grace according to God's mercy. We find even in the very beginning that when Abel offered an offering to God, he took from his flock. He offered a lamb. We're reminded of Abraham who God asked to give his only son, Isaac. And he was willing to do that. But as he was preparing to offer his only son, the son of promise, God stopped him and he provided. And you know, Isaac asked his father, well, we have the wood, we have the fire, but father, where is the lamb? And Abraham, being faithful, said, God will provide, son. God will provide a lamb. And when God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son, and Abraham was willing to do that because he is, he is faithful. He's the father of the faithful. And we find that he didn't know how God would do it, but he knew that God would preserve Isaac somehow, even if he had to resurrect him from the dead. So he just put his trust in him. But can you imagine what it would be like coming back home to Sarah without Isaac? And she would ask you, well, where is my son, my only son, the son of promise? the son that I named after my laughter because God told me to, the son that brings me joy every day, the son that I sacrifice for, that I live my life for. Where is he, husband? Can you imagine? That, you know, those thoughts went through Abraham. I mean, he's a man. He's a husband. He has a wife. Those thoughts went through his mind. It wasn't just the loss of a son or the, even the act of having to offer your son yourself to bring the blade of a knife down and bleed out the life of your son, your only son, the son of your old age. That's enough. But then to face what he would have to face later. I mean, we know what happened when he circumcised him. I mean, how Sarah reacted to that violently. But Abraham, regardless of all everything, was willing to do what God said because he trusted God. And God provided a ram. He provided a sacrifice on that day. I want us to think about the Lamb of God today. Can you see the Lamb? Do you see the Lamb? Are you watching for the Lamb? Or are you looking for the Lamb? How much value is the Lamb to you? How much time do you think? How much time do you... Do you set aside or in your life that you're thinking of 
the Lamb of God. You know, John said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Also says he, he knew Jesus. Jesus was his, his cousin. They probably grew up together. They were just six months apart. But it says there in John chapter 1 that seeing Jesus, he knew even before he came, even before the, the Holy Spirit rests upon him, rested upon him as a dove, even though that was a sign to John, God told him that would be a sign that this is my son, this is the Messiah, this is the Lamb of God. It's a strange thing, though, think. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The Messiah. When all of Israel is looking for a conquering hero, all of Israel is looking for a mighty warrior, a mighty general that will drive out the Romans and give sovereignty back to the nation of Israel. That's what they were looking for. Four, I want us to think about the lamb. Just let's shut our eyes. Just shut your eyes so that you can look in your mind's eye. And I want you to see John the Baptist at the Jordan, surrounded by people that are waiting to be baptized, and he is baptizing people. And then see Jesus walking from a little bit of a distance, and you see him, and then you see that John sees Jesus. And although he doesn't recognize that it's his cousin Jesus, he knows it's the one, it's the anointed one. It is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and he points and he cries out with a loud voice in the wilderness, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God! that takes away the sins of the world. Behold him. Do you see him? Can you see him? Do you know who he is? And he baptized Jesus. But he told Jesus before, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus said, there's no one ever been born greater than John the Baptist yet. Even he being Elijah, What an unceremonious death for that great man at the whim of a young girl being beheaded in prison. Can you see the lamb? Now, you see the lamb of God before Pilate. Picture him there. And Pilate is arguing, appealing for his release. I find no fault in this man. And he is there, silence. Silent as a lamb, not defending himself, but pouring out himself, laying down himself as that sacrificial lamb that would redeem the firstborn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Redeem the firstborn. And picture the crowd as a, many of those in the crowd that had witnessed the miracles, had heard a man speak like no man has ever spoken. A man speaking with the authority of God himself, giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, making the lame walk and raising the dead. There's many of them there that saw that. Those who hadn't seen it had heard. They had heard about Lazarus. They knew about Lazarus. It had recently happened. They knew that he'd been in the tomb for four days. And that Jesus waited. And on that fourth day, he said, remove the stone. And he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And life came back into Lazarus. And everyone could see that this man, this Lamb of God, this Jesus, this person who John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Well, now it's a whole lot easier to believe because 
The dead has been raised. He commanded death to leave and life to come. Behold the Lamb of God. But the crowd cries out. Many of those who had witnessed all those had, been, had seen it with their own eyes, cried out, crucify him, crucify him. See it. See it in your mind. And Jesus does not defend himself. And Pilate says, look, I'm going to have him beaten. And he's beaten so badly he did not even look like a man. He was not recognized as a, he was just a bloody mess of flesh. See it. See him standing there before the crowd and Pilate presents him. Here he is. He is near death even now. He will never be the same. He has been scourged beyond recognition. Let me let him go. Isn't this enough? See it in your mind. And the crowd says, no, it's not enough. Crucify him. And Paulo says, you deal with him. Go stone him. But no, they wanted the Romans to crucify him. They wanted him nailed to a piece of wood because whoever's nailed or hung from a tree is cursed. And they wanted him be to be considered to be cursed that he could never live again. No life. He would never live. No hope for any resurrection for this man. Forever cursed. That's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. It was the devil himself working in their, in their minds, inciting them. See it. Do you see it? And picture him struggling, weary from loss of blood, weakened, laboring to carry his cross to Calvary through the crowds who were mocking him and saying, who is this man that claimed to be God, that claimed to have done miracles? Save yourself. You save others. Can you not save yourself? See it. See what he endured. The Lamb of God in the form of man. The crown of thorns on his head, blood streaming down his face. And he pushes on and pushes on till his body could not go any farther. And then Simon, the Cyrene, was commanded by the Roman soldier to help him carry the cross. And Simon bends down, drops of blood fall on his sandal, cheek to cheek with the Lord, with the precious blood of the Lamb of God transferred over to him. He helps the Lord carry that cross where he will be nailed to it and put on display. See him there, the Lamb of God, doing the work of taking away the sins of the world. And see him as a little lamb, just beaten, a little lamb, pierced through. See, he was pierced in the side, pierced in the hands, pierced in the feet. Picture him being taken down, put in the tomb. And now picture the resurrection of the Lamb of God. And picture him coming to you and holding out his hands where you could see the holes where the nails had been and lifting up his robe that you may see where he was pierced through in the side and he's holding out his hands to you and he's smiling 
And he is saying, it is finished. It is finished, little children. For the Lamb of God has been slain, prophesied from the very beginning, ordained, predestined from the, before the foundation of the world for you, that you can now come to me You know, you can open your eyes now. I've seen the Lord embracing people. It's very touching. I've seen it. I've seen his face. I didn't see the back of him. I saw the back of some of you. It was during a Friday night praise and worship. It was right there, right in the aisle. And I was praising, and I looked over, and there he was. And we were just in line, and he was waiting. Every one of us was so special to him. And uh, we're a huggy church, but you ain't seen hugging till you see that. I mean, it's all. He, he got you all. He... You ain't going nowhere. It was very, very precious. And we were hugging back, trying, trying to. And he was, I saw the face. And I saw the joy. And I thought, you endured what you did for this. Because there was a great gulf between you and the children. They couldn't make it to you because sin stood in the way. But you laid down your life to make a way. We have to see the lamb. Do you see him? You see that he bore your guilt? He bears your guilt. He's your redeemer. He's your savior. He's your deliverer. He is a lover of your soul. I saw a testimony one time that was so powerful. <clears throat> it was a man, I guess about in his early or mid-60s. He had had a very rough life. He was a very mean person. Actually wanted to hurt as many people as he could. That was his goal in life. Lived some life of crime. But he was raised on a farm. I forgot which state, but it was here in the U.S. as a boy. And he had a mother and he had a brother and sisters, but his father was a very bitter, angry, hateful, filled with rage all the time man, and he oppressed them so terribly. So they, they really couldn't do much when he's around. I mean, it was just like a, a shell of a family, that's how he described it. Everyone was just so oppressed and beaten down, mentally and physically, mentally too, that they, that there was no close relationship with anybody. It was all fractured. I think the wife couldn't even, you know, and the mother couldn't really extend that normal you know, instinct of love and care for the children. It's just been beaten out of her. Everyone in the community knew. They knew how terrible the family was treated by this man. And there was one neighbor who had sheep. And one day he thought, you know, I'm going to give that little boy, that little neighbor boy, I'm going to give him 
one of my little lambs. When it's old enough to, you know, it doesn't need its mom to nurse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that to him. I think he will enjoy that. And he did. And man, what a bond. What a bond. I mean, that little lamb followed that little boy everywhere. It was his friend. He loved that lamb. And it made his life bearable. You know, where he would have to walk home from school, he had to cross a field to get to his house. And the little lamb would meet him out there in that field. Every day it would be there. He knew what time he was coming home from school, and it would be out there. And so that was his first you know, in coming back home, his last, as he would leave home, a home that is, was broken and where there was a lot of, of hatred and bitterness and torment, the little lamb would follow him out to the field as he went to school, walked to school in the morning. And so the last thing he would see, the last thing that he would experience was his relationship with that little lamb. The little lamb loved him and he loved the little lamb. And then when he would come home before he had to face, you know, the people in the home and this terribly dysfunctional home, the little lamb would meet him out there in the field. And so he had some happiness because of that. I think he was about eight years old or so at the time, but one day he, he came home from school and the little lamb wasn't there to meet him. And he was wondering where the little lamb was and up ahead he saw his, his father's truck and it had, had a flat tire and it was jacked up on one side and broken down his dad was there and he could hear his dad cursing and throwing tools and just in a rage because... He had a flat tire. He was afraid to say anything to his dad. He just tried to walk around him. But as he got around him, he saw that he saw his little lamb laying and just, just covered with blood. And he went over there. And he, he fell on the little lamb and the blood got on him and the little lamb had been beaten to death and stabbed through with a tire iron. Now, a tire iron was still there, pierced him through. The little boy was just filled with all kinds of emotions and anger. He knew his life was changed. He wouldn't have the one thing that brought him any happiness anymore. And he just ran. He just ran out in the woods and he just fell on his face and he was out there, but he was so angry. He was just seething with hate and he made a pack right there and he said, he was hurting so much and he said in his mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt as many people as I can in my life. I'm gonna hurt as many as I can and he did. And then in his 50s, after living a life like that and still living it, he came in contact with a Christian who was trying to witness to people. And he was trying to witness to him. He said, I don't care. I said, I've never been to church in my life. I, I don't know one scripture in the Bible, and I don't care to know. I don't care anything about any of that. You're wasting your time saying anything to me. And so the man who was witness to him said, okay, but just remember this and do this one time. You know, whenever you ever come across a Bible, if you ever find a Bible, look up, just look at John chapter 1, verse 29. And so we'll turn there. He didn't do anything. Knew nothing about Christianity.
verse 29. And this is John the Baptist. It's about John the Baptist speaking. And the next day he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when this man read that, he was, his interest was piqued. He's thinking, why is this man calling this other man a lamb of God? What is this about? So he began to research and read. And then he discovered that there was a heavenly father who had a lamb who presented his son as a lamb. And he offered his son, allowed his son to be beaten and pierced through and die for wicked people like him and like his dad. And it spoke to him. And the blood spoke to him. And he's thinking, I had the blood of my lamb on me. And I can feel that the father is placing the blood of his lamb on me. And it changed his life. I tried to find that testimony yesterday. I couldn't find it. I don't know the name of it, but when I do, I will put it on the church page. Some of you may have it or have seen it. It's so, so, so powerful. And it changed his life. Jesus as the Lamb of God. And I think we should probably read some of John's testimony here about Jesus being the Lamb of God, but let's consider John chapter 1 because John is telling us that this is the Lamb of God, but before, before his testimony, we find John, the apostle, John's testimony about Jesus, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and that this Word became flesh, and the Word had created all things. And the Word became flesh, and they dwelt among men. And he was full of grace and truth, and that he was the only begotten Son of the Father. God himself became a man. As we see in Philippians chapter 2, have this attitude in you that was in Christ. And though he existed equal with God from the very beginning. In other words, there was no difference between the Father and the Son. They were the same. They were equal. But one of them took the role of Son, and one of them took the role of Father for the purpose of expanding the family of God to bring many sons to glory. And you and I are the sons of God. Doesn't really matter what our gender is today because we are sons of God, firstborn sons of God that have been redeemed. We belong to the Lord. So here in 1 John, we'll begin in verse 19 in John, in John chapter 1. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent him to priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him who you are. And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now this tells us that John didn't know that he was Elijah. But Jesus said, if you can bear it, I'll tell you that John is Elijah. He was the second Elijah. We have Elijah to come, the third one. But John is the second Elijah. And he said, there's not been anyone born of women greater than that man. And it's, isn't it 
I mean, think about it. Here's John. And I mean, people know he's a great man. They even think maybe you're the Messiah. I mean, he's out there dressed kind of, you know, he's in animal skins. He's eating grasshoppers and honey, you know. Uh, so he, he, he is like a mountain man, you know. He's a rough and tumble kind of guy. He's out there living in the wilderness, doing God's work, crying out in the wilderness, come to me. He didn't go to the courtyard of the temple and preach. He went out where there was no one, and he cried out until God brought people. And God brought people. And all of Israel was coming out to be baptized by John. Not sure exactly what all that, each person was thinking about in their mind on what was actually happening. He was baptizing by water, but he said, he who comes after me is greater than me. I'm not even, un, I can't, I'm not fit to untie, untie his shoe. Do you hear what that's saying? Why would you untie someone's shoe? Wash their feet. He said, I'm not even fit to, I, I am below the lowest servant. I am not even fit to untie his shoe. I can't, I, I can't even, I mean, how is it that I'm going to baptize his whole body? You remember what Peter said? You'll never, Lord, you're not going to baptize. You're not going to wash my feet. And he said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you know, you won't have any part with me. And he said, well, then wash me all over. Give me a whole bath. Baptize me over from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And he said, well, you're already clean. You only need your feet. You know, it wasn't quite as low a servant to give, a, to give someone a bath. That's a little bit higher ranked job. But he said, I'm not even fit for that. You know, but I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire from on high. That's who... He is. That's who he is coming. And he is coming. That's John. And then after that, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Then he saw Jesus again. And he's got two of his disciples with him. And he turns to his disciples and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And those disciples left and began to follow Jesus. And that's exactly what John wanted. Matter of fact, John said, well, hey, you know what? I mean, you're, 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 aren't you worried about your, your followers leaving you? And he said, no. I've done my job. I was sent to prepare the way for the Lord. I've done that. I cried out in the wilderness. I waited patiently for years until he appeared. And when the Lamb of God appeared, then I did, as unworthy as I feel, I did what the Lord wanted me to do, and I baptized him. And now, I must decrease, and he must increase. That's what he said. He wasn't worried about anything personal like that. But think of how great and how selfless a man this was. He slept on the ground. He didn't have some uh, luxurious couch or bed to sleep in. He, he didn't go to restaurants. You know, he didn't uh, go out and, and, and uh, kill a deer and eat the venison or thing. He, he ate grasshoppers. And he found some honey and he would eat honey. And that's what he lived on. He did not live a life of comfort. He didn't have comfortable clothes. He lived in an uncomfortable environment. He suffered exposure. Yet he rejoiced before the Lord. He fulfilled his mission. At the end, he's in prison. And he begins to have doubts because John thinks the Lamb of God, the Messiah, is a conquering hero, a king who's, and a general who is going to push the Romans out. That's what he thought. That's what all the Jews thought. 
He wasn't seeing any of this happen. And so he sent, while he was in prison, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus and to ask, are you the one? I mean, think about it. Do you ever have doubts? What about Mary? Mary had doubts about Jesus. Even though Gabriel had brought the message. Even though she knew she conceived Jesus as a virgin. She had seen the miracles. She knew he could do them. Probably did lots of them at home. But when they were at that wedding in Cana and they needed some wine, she said, son. I said, mom, it's not my time yet. I mean, what am I going to do? It's not time yet. There's an appointed time for me to start. Okay. Get some pitchers of water. And nope, there it is. Now it's wine. And people said, wow, that's the best wine. That's be Would you keep the best wine for last for? Now we've all washed out our palates, but boy, we could do this is great wine. She saw that. She still had doubts. She went along with his brothers to take possession of Jesus because they thought they had gone crazy, looney tunes, gone out of his mind when he started making some of those claims. John the Baptist had seen the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus when he baptized him, and he heard the Father's voice out of heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He heard that. He saw it. He heard it. He was commissioned. He knew when he saw Jesus, even before he came to be baptized, that's him. This faithful man. That was his whole life. Yet, at the end, when he's in prison, and it, listen, and it's not working out like he had in his mind it was supposed to work out. We're often wrong. We're often. How many false, <laughs> how many people have predicted the day of the Lord because they read some things in the Bible, some prophecies in the Bible, and they got it figured all out. It goes, this goes with this and this one. Yeah, and that one here. Yeah, bring this one back over here. Okay, I got it figured out. Call Ellen G. White. How, how, how many times that work out? Well, it hadn't worked out once yet. <laughs> I remember Herbert Armstrong predicted the day of the Lord twice. It didn't work out. Because no prophecy can be figured out. You're not going to figure out any prophecy because it is spiritually discerned. It has to be <laughs> revealed by revelation. That's what the Bible says. Anytime, I mean, used to, we tried to figure out things. We were always wrong. <laughs> we figured that out. But here's John the Baptist. He's got it in his mind who Jesus is and what Jesus is going to do. And he's got scriptures to back it up. But he's ignoring some scriptures. He's ignoring like Isaiah chapter 53, you know, the suffering servant, Psalm chapter 22. He, he's not thinking about those. And you know why? Because you don't want to. We already have a default. We already have a position by which we want it to be. And therefore, it blinds us sometimes to see what is. Because we're not looking for what is. We're looking for what we want it to be. You see, we've got a face on it. John the Baptist did too. And it caused him, this man who had witnessed all of that, the commission of his entire life to then question, oh my. Go ask him, are you the one or should we wait for somebody else? Well, now how's John going to do anything? He's in prison, come on. He's in prison. I guess he thinks that God, if there's somebody else, God would miraculously deliver him from prison, spare his life. And then 
cry out in the wilderness again until this new guy comes along. Or maybe he sees two doves come down and he hears two voices. Or maybe the voice says, this one <laughs> is truly <laughs> my beloved son <laughs> in whom I'm very, very well pleased. And then that's the one. <clears throat> but this great man, I mean, there he is in prison. He does his work. Um, he doesn't have any disciples to speak of anymore that, that are not also disciples of Christ. I'm sure they still kept up with John, just like all of them did. They all loved John. Jesus loved John. And, um, but he's in prison, and this little girl dances, and her mom <laughs> wants the head of John the Baptist and whispers, ask for his head. Since he liked her dancing so much, how pitiful. And there he was beheaded, not just beheaded, but they deliver his head, this great man, on a silver platter. Verse 19, this is a testimony of John when the Jews sent him to priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, well, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Well, then are you a prophet? He said, no. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, well, I am the voice. I am, I am the voice. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. You know, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You know, people were convicted. He's saying, make your way. You know, the Lord is coming. The time is coming. You better make your path straight and you better walk in a straight path. So people were coming and they were being baptized as a, as a baptism of repentance, but it couldn't do anything about washing away sins. It was like the sacrifices that were given before with Israel. They had no power to take away sins, served only as a reminder that sin existed. It reminded you that you needed propitiation made for you in your behalf by a righteous sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing? If you are not the Christ and you're not Elijah and you're not a prophet, and John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. And he, it is he who comes after me. And, I, and he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoe. These things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan. Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. Bethany is where Lazarus was raised. That's why it was such a, you know, a risky thing for Jesus to go to Bethany because you're getting near Jerusalem. You know, there's going to be people uh, from Jerusalem there, especially at Lazarus' funeral or a mourning with the family after he had died and had been placed in the tomb. And, of course, the chief priests and Pharisees were looking for Jesus. And they really stepped it up after he raised Lazarus. It was expedited <clears throat> because they said, everybody's going to hear about this. And when they hear about this, everybody's going to follow this man. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After he comes, comes after me comes a man 
who has higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And that's significant because in, in the natural, John the Baptist was actually six months older than Jesus. So John the Baptist here is testifying that Jesus existed before he came in the flesh. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and the spirit remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the son of God. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter nine. Hebrews chapter nine probably will paraphrase most of this, but in, you know, the blood of a lamb, a righteous uh, offering had to be um, given in order for the blood to ratify the covenant, the new covenant. And the blood of an animal would not do it. It had to be the blood of a righteous lamb of God. Verse 22, it says of Hebrews 9, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, that means the, the animal sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifice than these. In other words, it wasn't enough. It had to be something other than the animals. For Christ did not enter a holy place with, with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor was it that he would offer himself often as a high priest enters the holy place year by year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Now, that's why Jesus is the high priest Melchizedek, and we are a royal priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, we are not, we're not only greater than that of Levi and Aaron, we preceded that priesthood because the priesthood that we're a part of had no beginning of days nor end of days, just like, just like uh, Melchizedek, who is Jesus. Verse 26, otherwise he would have needed to suffer since the foundation of the world, but now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And therefore, he gave himself as the Lamb of God. And inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation, notice, without reference to sin. Without reference to sin. Because you have no sin in Christ. We are unblemished. We are pure. <clears throat> Our sin is in the body of death, which is called the body of sin in Romans 7. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for, the salvation, for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Verse 1 of chapter 10 for the law, since it has, only, it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and it is not the very form of things, 
can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have been ceased to be offered because the worshipers having been cleansed would no longer have, uh, have a consciousness of sins. So what he's saying is, how is it that every year there had to be blood offerings? Every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies with, with the blood of an animal for himself and the, to, to, to uh, serve as a propitiation for himself and then blood for uh, the uh, propitiation for the people of Israel. And he had to do it every year. But now, God has done it through his lamb. And it's done once and for all. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, and this is very important for us to see right here, where he's quoting, uh, you know, he's quoting the prophecies. Therefore, when it comes, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And that's body is Jesus. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written in me to do your will, O God. And after saying that, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which is offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who were sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, and it's ratified, ratified by this blood. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them, and in and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. And so, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that's the confidence that we have because of the work of the Lamb of God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. More people would rather talk about the lion than the lamb. But did you know that the lion is a lamb? A lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Bible says here in chapter 5, is a lamb. So oftentimes we picture uh, Jesus as the lion and fierce and majestic. And, you know, we think of the, those movies. Um, uh, what's the name of that movie where the, the, the lion, you know what I'm talking about? It was C.S. Yeah, Narnia, right? Yeah, the Narnia movies. What's his, what was his name in that one? Aslan. Aslan, that's right. But in reality, it is a lamb. Notice verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him, 
who sat on the throne. That's the Father. A book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And then no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Now let's understand that this is a scroll and there are several seals. You break one at a time and you can read so much. You break another one, you can read more. And it's just, that's, that's how you unravel the scroll. So the book is actually a scroll and it's sealed. Now these seals are going to release the wrath of God. And no one is worthy to, to, to commence judgment against the world until the lamb shows up, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who turns out to be a lamb. And John said, I began to weep greatly because John wanted justice. He had seen the persecution of the saints. I mean, John is in his 90s at this time. He's seen Jerusalem fall. He's seen, uh, you know, Christians burn in their rose garden. He's seen that. He's seen Christians blamed for the fires of Rome by the Emperor Nero. He's seen all that. He himself is imprisoned on the island of Patmos. All the other apostles have been slaughtered. They've been martyred for the cause of Christ. He's seen and heard stories of how Christians, young, old, babies, are made sport of and slaughtered in the Colosseum for sport. He's seen all that. He knows all that. He wants judge justice. And no one is able in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, anyone who has ever even lived. There's nobody they can resurrect that's worthy. Abraham's not worthy. Enoch isn't worthy. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book and to look into it. Now picture him weeping greatly, just sobbing his shoulders, just. And it seems like the end. It seems like justice will never be accomplished. Judgment will never come upon the wicked. And one of the elders, that's the, one of the 24 elders before the throne of God who sing praises to the Lord said, stop weeping. Behold, look, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has overcome. So as to open the book and its seven seals. So he's pointing and he says, see the lion? He is worthy because he has overcome. But notice what John saw when he looked. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing. So the lion was a lamb. As if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And that is the reason that we have the golden bowl. And I mean, we pray prayers, but we also understand that some of you don't want to make the prayer known publicly. Therefore, you write it down and you put it in this bowl. And we offer it with our incense because our prayers, as it says here, are offered 
and the golden bowls of incense. So that's just our custom here to do that. And we've seen prayers answered. So the elders fell down before the Lord, and each one of them had a harp, and they had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's us. That's the redeemed firstborn of God. Do you hear me? You are the redeemed firstborn of God. It doesn't matter at all what you are on this earth. Doesn't matter if you're not well known on this earth. Doesn't matter what you have or don't have on this earth. Doesn't matter where you live or don't live on this earth. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You belong to him. And you're not home anyway. This isn't home. This is not home. One day we'll look back. One day in paradise and glory, we'll look back and say, how did we ever stand that place? How is it that we ever had any kind of an affectionate feeling for that place? You know, we, will, we deal with we deal with emotions and feelings and thoughts that we don't think anything about. We don't notice them, usually, because that's what it is to live in this world. There's no one in here at perfect peace. No, nobody. We know in this world we have an enemy. We know that at any given moment, an asteroid could come right through the roof and kill all of us. An airplane, there's an airport right over here, an airplane could just do a nosedive and crash right in here and kill, kill all of us. That could happen. It could be some maniac that demons have stirred up that try to break in here and, and kill us all. It happens. It happens. Does it? Things like that even happen in America, but they happen in the world. Look at what's been going on in Africa, and then what happened with, with uh, you know, uh, in the Middle East with ISIS. I mean, and before that, Al Qaeda. I mean, it's, it's just terrible. We're not really secure. There's enough weapons in this world to destroy everyone on this earth many, many times over. Russia just unveiled a new submarine that has a special uh, submarine that detonates underwater that creates a 300-foot tidal wave. Think about what that would do to a coastal city. 300 feet. 300 feet. A 30-story building. You have enemies. You don't know what the, the, the devil is. is the devil is, is he, he's got a strategy for every one of us. Right now, he's busy preparing somebody to be a thorn in your flesh. And yet we'll be so surprised when that happens. <laughs> I will be so surprised. Well, I didn't see that coming. No, we didn't. We didn't see that coming. But uh, he doesn't ever stop. He will never stop. When you're driving your car, also when you're out on the road, your truck, you have no idea. You've seen lots of things. You've seen lots of accidents. I know you have too, Jody. I mean, 
You've seen accidents out there and, and you've seen people drive so foolishly, ridiculously foolishly, taking their life and other, other people's lives in their own hands. And, um, but you don't ever know what can happen. Joe, do you driving along in your truck, you know, and have a blowout in the front tire. Next thing you know, you know, you basically totaled your truck, even though you chose to have it repaired, but insurance totaled it. I mean, it just happens like that. You just never know what can happen. I mean, strange things happen all the time. While we're sitting here having the services, there's been hundreds, thousands of people will die. Some of them be natural deaths. Some of them will be accidents. Some of them will be, you know, perpetrated by other people. Animals kill people. We live in a world where we have to be alert. And we don't even think about that. You're never totally at peace because you do not know what's coming around the corner next. You don't know, uh, you know, who's going to confront you and how and why. You know, just because of who you are in Christ and the devil's stirring them up. You don't know. When we have our tent meetings, we don't know who's going to show up. We don't know if some guy's going to show up there wearing a bomb or if somebody's going to show up there with a gun. You know, we don't have any idea, but you just go out in faith. That's what it is, though, to live in this world. When our children go on a trip, maybe they're driving and we're concerned, man, we know that accidents happen every day. We don't want them to be killed in a car accident. We don't want them to be pinned in a mass of twisted, you know, burning hot metal. We don't even want to think about something like that. And there's just other things. We have to be careful when we peel, peel a, t a potato so that we don't slice our finger open, you know? I mean, there's just lots of things that we have to be careful of. We live on edge. We live in a degree of, you know, fear. A little bit of anxiety, on guard, ready. And all the animals do too, every one of them. They all live that way. Sometimes when I take Abby out in our fenced-in backyard, she doesn't want to get, go off the deck because it's dark. And sometimes it just kind of seems a little spooky out there. Oh, yeah, you know, when it's daylight, she acts big. But, you know, sometimes, you know, she'll just like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll hold, maybe I don't really have to go potty. I'll just hold it until the morning, you know. And I'll say, no, come on. And I'll go down the steps with her off the deck. Come on out here. You can use it. You can do it. But sometimes it's just that way. On the walking trails, it's the same way. That's what we live like. Do you, can you imagine what it's going to be like in perfect peace? In paradise, we won't ever even think about that. We, first, we won't even be able to be hurt or die. <laughs> and there'll be no one wicked to come against us. There'll be no predators that we have to worry about. There'll be no accidents. That's the glory. And we won't miss this place. <laughs> We're not going to miss this existence at all. We're going to say, wow, what a difference. You know, sometimes uh, until you're set free, you don't know how 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 much you're in bondage until you're set free. Once you're set free, you say, wow, you know, I was really in bondage. Verse 11, then I look and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and of the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worship. Chapter 17, 
Now, this is a chapter about Babylon the Great, but in verse 11, notice the beast which was, so this is the end time beast, a revival of the Roman Empire, which is probably the European Commonwealth of Nations, the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth as, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. And then we'll conclude with chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Afterwards, I'll call Austin to come up and close us in prayer and ask a blessing on our potluck meal. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down He who accuses them before our God day and night. And speaking of us, and they overcome him because of the blood of the lamb. How do we overcome him? The blood of the lamb. And because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Do you see the lamb? 